recording. All right, welcome to today's episode of Firefighting Fridays. I'm Jeff Diedrich with Strategic Fire Training. Uh, today's discussion, we have Chad Groover, John Mateer, Jerry Knapp, and of course, Jeff Shoup. Uh, we're going to focus in on uh, engine operations at large fires, concentrating on large caliber streams, uh, different applications, uh, rate of flows, elevations, uh, the ones that are easy to, easier to deploy, the ones that are maybe a little, take a little more forethought in it. And of course, some experience-based lessons from uh, our senior men. So let's get into it. Um, heavy streams, when an engine company thinks about heavy streams and where and when they're gonna be applied, that can vary due to perspective, whether you're talking rural operations where there's a barn on fire, uh, a suburban department that has fire on two floors of a house, or a, a busy metro big city fire department that may have like a, a mill going with fire on four floors of several thousand square feet at a time. So uh, where do you think we should start with this, Jeff? Uh, start off with the definition of a master stream. Okay. All right. So according to some training manuals that we've used in the past, a master stream is generally something that flows 350 gallons a minute or greater. So, you know, when we get into heavy stream operations, it can be misleading at times where what we see now, <clears throat> and it's due to the technology, I think, that's uh, helped us actually. And that is the hoses that are out there <clears throat> with the synthetic or polymer or impregnated tube linings allow greater flows at lower friction loss, as we all are aware of. Uh, it allows us to get water flowing at a greater volume. And then like, for example, if we're going to talk about like a, like a, a monitor, a small mobile monitor, you know, some acronyms are like RAM, R-A-M, Rapid Attack Monitor. Uh, manufacturers have their own title for them. But anyways, you can supply those with a single line of two and a half. And it's great for quick knockdown on one of those fires that you were talking about. It could be a rural fire or suburban fire, or even in inner city operations where you want to get a, a, a larger stream going than what a hand line would employ. And so that allows you to make a good hit, shut the thing down, reposition it, and go after it again. And so that's uh, probably the, the smallest that we should see when we're talking about that 350 to 400 gallon that range, really that should be on a large, large fire. That should be the minimum that we ever see flowing. So again, you were mentioning a, a, a department that has mill buildings and things like that. You know, Groover's got those wood frame four and five story apartment houses. In a building like that, where you have fire going on several floors, you know, you've got to get those heavy streams of larger flow because you want to employ their penetrating force and their extra volume to get in there and blast away and get to the seat of the fire. So understanding what the definition of a master stream is, what gallonages you're getting, and also the pressures that it requires to get those flows so they do the job for you. That's probably a lot of words out there, you know, that I'm putting out there. But, you know, I think we got to understand what is a master stream. The other thing is about understanding major fires and heavy stream operations. Look, the old adage, you know, that will surround this building with his, uh, hand lines. If you have a fire building of that nature and you're going to surround this building with inch and three quarter lines or whatever, that's telling you right there, you're going in under gun you don't have enough water to do the job. You're just in a holding pattern in that, in that fashion. So I think one, if I can interrupt you, the, no. we, we've all heard or seen like the multiple hand line argument uh, versus a, a larger single line flowing a lot more water. Um, I think what we're, a lot of people may get lost when thinking about that. Why doesn't that make sense is that it's the rate of application is what we're looking for. And if you have, you know, 500 gallons a minute divided up amongst five hand lines. I mean, the rate of application may be the same, but that water is not going in the same place at the same time. So that rate of application is really what we're looking for to reduce the fire. And 
So with that, combined with figuring out how do we reach the fire from that nozzle, of the master stream is really the, uh, the part that takes a little bit of planning and execution. How do we get that water to the, the seat of the fire most efficiently from a master stream? And um, that's where elevated platforms come in. Um, also portable uh, deployment of uh, master streams, whether it be a RAM device or some other type of ground monitor. Um, I guess for me, I want to just poke that in that this is the argument. You know, the rate of application to one singular place is what matters. Chair, do you have anything you want to throw out there? Because I got something, to, but I'll wait. Uh, I think Jeff's point is, is good. You know, we're, we're good at stretching an inch, three quarter, two inch, getting inside. That's kind of our mindset. But you pull up when there's fire everywhere. You know, it's time to change change tactics a little bit and get that rate of application up high. I also think there's a little bit of a, you know, we're concerned about pushing the fire back in a building, but if we kill a fire with the rate of flow that Jeff's talking about, we don't have to worry about pushing it. So yeah. uh, just the, the first step needs to be right, like you guys were saying. I think it's worth talking too about the history. I mean, what, before the advent of our actual hose carts and, and having hose with nozzles, like the master stream was what the fire service was built on. We had a hand pump cart with some type of stream shaping device at the end of the, the pump. I mean, this is where we started. Um, and do you think maybe back then they, those firefighters were more likely to move that apparatus around and to continually get advantage on the fire? I mean, now we use the hose, but when you see a ladder truck set up or a master stream gets set up somewhere, typically it sits there for maybe too long. It, once it makes its effect, it may stay there for 30 minutes to an hour to two days, who knows, but yeah. rather than move it where it might do, continue to do what we want it to do. What did you have there, Jeff? I know you're- I was going to throw something out there about volume and rate of application. And that is, and you guys touched on it. So when we have a large building, let's just say an old four or five story mill building, industrial building, warehouse, I don't care, uh, a big building with a tremendous fire load in it. And John, I know you have seen it. I know I have seen it and probably everyone here has seen the fire in a large, uh, large building, lots of fire. And you see an inch and three quarter line pulled yeah, it just defies logic how that happens. But it goes back to what Jeff and, uh, and uh, Jerry were saying earlier about we get into that mindset of the, the small, quick, easy to put in operation hand line. And I mean, I've had guys, you know, when I've questioned them, of course, it's like, why did you pull that size line? Well, I felt if I could get in there quick, I could get a lot of water on a fire. You're not, and the truth is, you're not getting a lot of water in a fire. You know, fires of that magnitude, your inch and three quarters shouldn't even be out of the bed, but we see them being stretched. The other thing is a great illustration, and this is, this is uh, what you get into when you have those old industrial complexes burning. And, and, and even some of these newer apartment complexes, like we said, we said with Chad, you know, down in his area in Texas, Chris, they got all those new buildings going up, you know, where they're all wood frame. So if they burn, and they grab hold of that building on several floors and you're throwing water. And even in a range, I would, I'm just guessing, saying 500, 600 gallon a minute streams. Have you ever seen a stream go across the sky and all of a sudden, boom, it's gone? Sure. It's because of thermal columns. And also that the, the heat is just taking that stream and blowing it apart. You know, disintegrating it before it even gets anywhere near the fire. Another problem that we create in that situation is when you see guys who are over pumping and this is where that thing over pumping comes in again when you over pump what happens to your stream it tend to has a tendency once it leaves the nozzle it just wants to break apart into smaller streams and that's why you got to tell people no back it down to if you got a solid stream on a master stream device then pump it at 80 like it should be pumped once we get guys excited and that pump operator turns that throttle up, you got more mist and spray coming off the stream than what have water going to the fire. 
Yeah, and it's all like, hey, come on, let's let's uh, put everything in our perspective right here. Yeah, yeah, and the and what I I haven't seen with master stream operations is no, nobody taking the time to say, hey, take off the engine three eighths tip. Let's go bigger. We have the water supply. Yeah, you know, that that's a huge step that gets missed, and what you end up with, like you said, is an underpowered elevated stream that, that that's just not going to make it. So. When we position, we should also plan for the amount of water. Right? Yeah. Well, that's knowing your system too. Again, if you're in an area like has newer water mains and things like that, you know, you, you should have an idea that, yeah, we got 2,000 gallons a minute to come out of our hydrants. Yeah, we got 3,000 gallon a minute at every intersection or main intersection because of the size of the piping and so forth. And if you're in an older city or town, look at what Jerry's got to deal with. You've heard Jerry talk about his water system that's going to run out pretty soon if we get a big fire and there's a lot of places like that and the guys are not knowledgeable of that in those departments or they don't think about it one or the other i don't know so jeff i think that's important because you know there's all this talk about tapping a hydrant and putting 16 hoses on a hydrant if you don't know what the hydrant flows what what, what the hell you know you, you can't make the water come out that's not there so how about we broaden our scope a little bit if we're talking about master streams and just look a little bigger, you know? Uh, again, the, the, what Jeff was talking about is uh, I got a, a, a water district in my first due area that if we uh, apply master streams, runs out of water in two hours. It's, it's just simple as that. The hydrant is broke. <laughs> you, know? you All you got to do is tap it. <laughs> so so I, I think... Uh, Maybe one more uh, vein of this to talk about um, is, is the master stream arena, the place where automatic nozzles may in fact help an operation where you don't have to worry about taking tip size off to match your capacity. Because if you have a, a thousand gallon per minute capable automatic nozzle, you should end up with a good reach, whether you're pumping 500 gallons a minute or a thousand gallons a minute. Is that an argument to have that automatic at the end of that pipe, Jeff? Yes, it is. I, 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 know, I don't call it an argument. Gotcha. I call it knowing your tools and equipment. Exactly. Whether it's a master stream automatic nozzle or a hand line on an inch and three quarter automatic nozzle, when you put on a straight stream setting, you have a hollow tube of water. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the thing about a fog stream on a straight stream setting. It's a, it's microscopic droplets of water put in the shape of a tube that's the whole thing about an automatic or or fog nozzle i should say and where a solid stream again hand line or master stream it doesn't matter it's a solid tube it's got that weight it's got that force it's got that uh, momentum and that penetrating force it goes back to our argument when we go out and uh, work with uh, departments and do training that we're telling people to take as much water in with you as you can to kill it as quick as you can and do it as quickly as you can. Am I right? Yeah. So and I guess yeah. where I've, where I've seen the automatic nozzles, what I think is a good argument for them or it is in that rural setting, they have them on the back of an engine that may go to uh, those barn fires once or twice a year. And there it's on a 1500 gallon or 2,500 gallon, you know, tanker. And they want to be able to stretch that three inch, way up the lane and, and put 750 gallons a minute on a barn and uh, they can do that with without worrying about calculating for the, the tip size and uh so when it comes to master streams like we were saying in the beginning it it takes a lot of planning and um knowing your systems and knowing your capabilities of what you're going to plan intending on using them for it's a big thing yeah um so here's the stump the chump question on the automatic nozzle. When was that automatic nozzle last serviced and tested? We tested uh, 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 probably close to 50 or 60 automatic nozzles here in Rockland a couple of years ago. We had an 85% failure rate because they were not maintained. So with the automatics, especially with the ones that where the water flow, uh, where the the waterway has to be greased. Every time it, get, it flows water, it takes the grease out, the lubricant. So those, the two dissimilar metals, you know, uh, react and, and, and lock up. And 
so the theory behind an automatic nozzle, I think, is tremendous. If it's not maintained, like Jeff said, you don't know your tools um, and you haven't taken care of them, it ain't going to work the way you think it is. And what we saw was interesting. Not only they would not flow, uh, we did hand lines. So it would flow like 70, 80, 90 gallons a minute. And as we increased the pressure, it would all of a sudden the that those two metals would release and all of a sudden we're up to 300 gallons a minute or 250, whatever it was. And so if you're on a hand line, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're doing good. And all of a sudden, boink, you got double the nozzle reaction and maybe you're not even staying there. Or maybe you're not even upright anymore. So just, just a thought. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Great point. Did you guys determine if the water in your system had anything to do with the calcification of the spring and so forth, because that was the big thing. Once you guys did that test, and I remember looking at uh, results of, you know, and you know, uh, finding out what was happening, the calcification from the water could coat the spring. Yeah, we we didn't. The... Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no. We... We didn't get that far into it. We we have pretty hard water around here, though. Yeah. So uh, I think that's definitely a factor for sure. Yeah, yeah. You made a great point about the uh, automatic nozzle being greased. I remember we had the white grease, and you you hit it right in the head, man. So what? <laughs> the, the water goes through the nozzle, and the grease is gone in a couple minutes. You know. So. No. Working in a place that doesn't have automatics um, and hearing about nozzle maintenance, I, I got to wonder if there's a lot of departments out there that are using those, um, not even maybe by their choice, but that's what they have to use. And there is no nozzle maintenance program. And oh. there, there is no testing. Like, I got to believe that. Yeah. It yeah. put them at such a huge disadvantage, especially at a bread and butter fire where, you know, you're trying to, you know, get somebody get between the fire and the people but in a large caliber fire you know you're really trying to put some heavy water in maybe you're not even doing that I, you know. I remember an old boss many 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 years ago talking about large fires and master streams and he pulls out a solid tip and he says this is what puts the fire out when you're talking a fire of that magnitude and as i've collected videos from uh and, and other th uh, stories from departments around the country, old departments, you know, and so forth. Their history, their tradition, so many of them, they would use that solid bore anytime they went into the so uh, master stream operations. Again, it's a selling feature, you know, somebody comes into your department and says, hey, you need this, you need that. And by the way, you don't have a fog stream or an automatic nozzle on your master stream. Well, you need that because you can blow the vapors away. What the hell? You're talking about a major fire. And you got to have street stream reach. You have to have volume, shattering force, and penetration for that type of situation. So, if you want to buy it as a tool to have when it's time calls for it, that's something different. But you know, so so the history of uh, master streams. I, I at what point did, did we start putting them on top of, of ladders? Was that like the twenties, thirties when they started going up with? With the ladder truck technology and, and and then at what point did we figure out that the deck gun on top of an engine needs to be more mobile than the multiple piece ground monitor kit that i grew up with um i mean that was a game changer for i think for large fires was having an engine company able to rapidly deploy a ground monitor yeah um i, th I think to start off answering your question about you know ladder pipes if you take a look uh actually there was a device before ladder pipes and it was a water tower and this was still back in the era of horse-drawn apparatus you had water tower companies in fact i've got that video of uh cleveland i think it's 1904 or something like that and it shows what they used to call firepower demonstration. That's, uh, you know, the fire department was uh, taking a Saturday in the fall, I guess. I don't know what time of the year it was. But anyways, they would show the fire, the, uh, fire department to the public. And 
you'd have the ladder companies going by, but then here comes a water tower unit going by. And what it was, it was a boom which had piping in it. And when they got to the scene of a major fire, and especially in a major uh, uh, building, they would take this boom up and then the, the pipe could either extend or retract, but it was a solid bore. And that's what they did. They did not have ladder pipes on uh, uh, in service, I would say, till, till sometime later. And don't ask me when, because I don't know. Uh, but, you know, that, that was the probably the advent of putting uh, master series on, on ladders, because you got to remember back then, too, aerial ladders were made of wood. Right. So you had to worry about, you know, any stress or something that might crack the beams or cause the ladder to collapse and things like that. So. John, is the is Cleveland Fire still using the uh, the kit where they would hook it onto the ladder and then run the three inch up and connect it to it? We we still have one of our spares that we have to do that with one or wow. two, but all the other ones are integrated into the uh, aerial device. Okay. Some things sometimes things move slowly, you know, as far as a little bit. Those those are real pain in the butt, especially in our weather. The yeah. cold weather. Yeah, the ropes start breaking and stuff starts freezing. Yeah. Not a lot of fun. Good times. Well, what about I would say what was the the late nineties, maybe the two thousands when uh, the ground monitors really came into their own and started showing up everywhere. Um we've seen a lot of different technology with those and at this point they seem as light and as firefighter friendly as possible um chad you you have some experience with uh a ground monitor that you could share where you think it made made a difference or uh well i just when i moved from the engine to the quint in the last three months is when i really had to change <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Shoop's laughing. It's about as funny as him saying, uh, having to agree with an automatic nozzle. <laughs> you could see the pain <laughs> in his face when he said it. Uh. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have this, the way I look at it, I have an engine that has defensive capabilities, you know, because I have a fog tip on the end of my quint. And uh, it, it can flow 1250. That's fine. But, you know, it's defensive fire if I'm having to use that right off the bat. So, you know, on my old engine, I had a deck gun and I'd always use a deck gun for my quick hits. Where my crews had to change is, is now we don't have that quick hit of capability when we get there. And it's only been two months. So we haven't had the fire where we needed to use it. Um, but so what I've done is I've just taken a ram and putting a ram in my back compartment so we can take that mobile hit quick. And I've had to teach the guys, hey, you know, one man can do this between you and the driver. Let's get it out quick. And that's now our deck gun. It's just a mobile deck gun is the way I tell them to look at yeah. it. And, uh, you know, the ram, you know, we've used others. We've used the uh, the other manufacturers. Uh, I think they're called Mercury, Blitzfire. And the ram just, the guys seem to be able to get the ram in place where they want the water a lot quicker and you have more control of where that water goes. You know, I can get three, 400 gallons on something quickly. And mm -hmm. then, then, like I said, shut it down. And when the my crew, you know, I think I have my medic doing the ram when we get there, when we practice it, I'm going to have the medic do the ram while they're outside and hit it. And then while they're doing that, we're pulling the lines to go in, you know, as soon as they're done with it but you don't have how much water you, how much water do you have on your apparatus i only have 500 gallons so i've got one minute and then you yeah. know it's more than that get a you know the way i have it set up now is one guy grabs the ram the other guy helps with the water supply off of the medic and then you know if we still need more big water and we run out well we'll open the, we'll get the water connection and water supply and keep doing it until we need to but yeah, I think, you know, I've had the one, my old engine had the the deck gun that I could mount anywhere and take it off the top of the deck and put it on the tripod on the ground. And that just seemed like a pain in the butt. Plus, those things are really heavy <laughs> and trying to get it down. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Huh? 
They were extremely heavy. Extremely heavy. And I mean, 75, 80 pounds on the top of an engine. You're trying. Yeah, to I'm just going to hang over and hand it. this to somebody. It never worked. So <laughs> I do like the mobile monitors a little bit better. And of course, since I've been with you guys, you know, what last week, John and I were using the RAM and teaching it. So it works a lot better, I've found. Yeah, for Jerry. sure. Help us out here, Jerry, with getting firefighters to understand that we want to, when we pull up, that we need to get the water out of the water tank and onto the fire as quickly as possible. And we got to fight that mindset. I'm turning it over to you for that one. Yeah, of saving the water and you got to pace yourself, you know, let, <laughs> let, let's give that fire a good shot. I think Chad said something really important. You know, you got that, or, and you guys, John was mentioning that 500 gallons, if you can kick that fire in the butt with 500 gallons, it buys you some time, you know, with that tank water. Um, of course, obviously, if you don't give it a good enough knock, it's coming back really, really fast. And maybe that wasn't the right thing that day, but it's always a good shot. I, right. I think there's another option. You know, Chad talked about the Quint. And uh, uh, I had a very successful fire one night. We were short of manpower. There is, this is a residential neighborhood. The houses were close, two and a half story wood frames. The one house is like got fire from, you know, the shrubs through the attic. I mean, there's just fire. There's no house. There's just all fire. So the Quint pulls up, um, didn't drop a line from the hydrant. Uh, we had 300 gallons of water. I stretched an inch and three quarter uh, into the driveway of the house that was burning. Used the cars as a as a heat shield, and and man, it was it was hot. So I was glad to duck down. We dumped that five or that 300 gallons of water on the exposure, and that bought us enough time. There was nothing left to save in the house, so that bought us enough time to get water through the uh, through the aerial and knock the knock the main body of fire down. But um, you know, we talk about getting water in a fire right away, and that's important. Maybe one of the, well, not maybe, one of the options we need to look at strategically is, do we protect the exposures first with the limited amount of water we've got? And then that, again, that buys us some time to put some serious water on the fire. So just just options. Yeah. I think you, you make the uh, point, and I can, if I could summarize, if you don't have the capability to stop the fire, with the rate of application at your disposal, then go to exposures and and take care of where the fire wants to go versus where the fire is, you know. Exactly. And it doesn't take a lot of water to protect the exposure. You know, you get that water running down the side of the building. Yeah, you know, I think the other thing is important is that there was a, this big uh, years ago, water curtains, water curtains, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, the water curtain, the science tells us it's just not dense enough to, right. to get all of that um, radiant heat. So a lot of radiant heat makes it through the water curtain. And I always thought, I don't, I don't have any basis for this, but I always thought water curtains worked because enough water got on the exposure by accident, you know, um, and, and that's why it worked, you know, so. Right. Yeah. I think William Clark talked about that, water curtains. And the, 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 I guess you call it the uh, mis, mis, misreadings or misunderstandings about them, yeah. so forth. Yeah, he talked about opacity of water mm -hmm. and that it has none. So radiant heat is light energy. And mm -hmm. so it just passes that heat right on through, like you said. Uh, the guys brought up last week, we were flowing the rams and the uh, two and a halfs and so forth. So when we got into the scenario, we had that forward lay and we went into the deck gun with water from the tank. And you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I uh, remember, I think uh, Micah was timing, you know, from the time the uh, deck gun's flowing to the time it ran out, it was about a minute. The 500 gallon water tank pumping at 80 PSI through an inch and three eighths tip, it just seemed to fall right in place. And that was the thing about the forward lay. So fire department said, you know, when you turn the corner and you got that big ball of fire waiting down the street for you and you're gonna do a forward lay, okay, you stop, you know, get the hydrant, the firefighter on the hydrant, he loops it, waves the engine on that engine pulls up and positions itself in a good position uh that it can apply that 500 gallons of water where it can possibly make a knock or possibly slow it down or something all that time that firefighter at the hydrant should be having that in the hydrant hooked up to that supply line so within that minute of water 
that pump operator is, <laughs> we told those guys up there too, when we were running the scenarios, you better have your running shoes on. And uh, they did a great job. You know, they're great. Uh, those students were super, but the deck guns flowing and you got to get that supply line broken in the intake then, and then make the call for water. So if you run out of water, okay, fine. But at least you got 500 Fair gallons man. of water on the water on the fire. So, yeah. Uh, Jeff, go, go ahead, John. Going along the lines of what you are saying, the only way that those things happen is with training, right? Yeah. So if you don't train, you know, as you're driving down the street, that's not the time to try and run that play, you know? Right. You should have practiced it before. You asked earlier, why do you guys take into the three-quarter line to a big fire? <sighs> train with? A couple, a couple of reasons. One is uh, they don't know any better. They, they're not even thinking about how to read the fire. Uh, it might be the boss's fault. He might be, he might have the same problem that guys on the back step have right? or whatever, you know? So it's a lot of things going into why they're not putting that big fire, the big water on the fire. Right. Right. Very uh, good. Like, I know I'm going to be captain obvious here, but um, I think we need to say it. Cause I didn't think we needed to say it last week. Never walk in front of a master stream. <laughs> You know, good, no, good point. You know, you, you get hurt when you do that. It's just, yeah, we had a... We'll, we'll leave names out and cities out. No, 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 it was a mistake. Know. It was a mistake made by a young firefighter. And we're flowing uh, during the scenario. And for some reason, he stepped in front of it and got hit. So, folks, a master stream especially is unforgiving. You get in its way, it's gonna, it's gonna blow you out of the out of its way. So, let's okay, about, move on. Think about, think about the force that's involved. Eight pounds a gallon. You got say you got two hundred gallons, well three hundred gallons a minute. You, it's like a ton of water a minute coming out of there. You know. Yeah. Let alone one hundred and sixty gallons, which well, happened to, happened to be the one he walked in front of. How much was it, Chad? I think we were getting what? What was our flow meter? We we're going 460, 480. Yeah, oh, yeah. We only had a minute of water, so we were right around 500. So maybe yeah. a little less than 500 a minute. I mean, that's a lot of weight. And like yeah. in Chad's case, if he has these new lightweight buildings, you got to think about how much water weight you're adding to the building. Um, that's a good point, Jeff. You and I were talking about the Venadome yesterday. Cubic feet of water. How much? What? 63 pounds. How long does it take to put a cubic foot of water mm -hmm. into a building? Well, see, that, that's the whole thing. When you have a, uh, a lot of fire, in this case, the Vendome Hotel was an older building and built back in the late 1800s. But you take a building that's been altered, which it had been. That was another thing. Barry Wall has been breached or removed for whatever, you know, alterations they were doing. And then you have a heavy body of fire working on the steel columns and things like that. Then you have the water weight added and then you put a bunch of firemen in there after they knock the fires down and go in to overhaul it and you got to slosh it around in six or eight inches of water that's angle, you know, deep, <laughs> you know. You know, yeah, when I think of that and, you know, I think of, uh, we've all been there in Portland, the crystal ballroom, that floated wooden floor. Mm -hmm. What if we were putting water on top of that? Yeah. Oh, see, that's the thing about company inspections knowing the buildings. And if you get a heavy body of fire and you're resorting to master stream operations, Jerry, what'd you just say? A ton of water a minute goes through a, well, is that, or is that, a, no, that's a two and a half, right? Well, if it's eight pounds a gallon, you're flinging 500 gallons. Like John said, that's what a ton of water, right? Yeah. Uh, two tons. A ton, it's two, two tons. tons a minute. That's two right. 4,000 4, pounds yeah. a minute. So, uh, I mean, you know, how quick does a minute go on the fire ground? Right. <laughs> Right. And that's the other thing about positioning firefighters and equipment and apparatus. Yeah, let's get into that. Like, the, it's part of the master stream planning and setup. I mean, yeah. You don't want to turn your yourself or your apparatus into an exposure, either for the fire or from collapse. Yeah. So. All right. So once again, how big is your building? Is it a long building? Is it a tall building? Is it a combination of both? Is there uh, any windage? Because I remember when we were doing the uh, the MICTO series classes, that's Managing Company Tactical Operations that came out of the National Fire Academy for, for uh, 
teaching across the country. Three things that impact a fire, and that's temperature, uh, temperature, I'm sorry. Wind. The wind, what the heck was the, I'm a brain fart. But I know the wind had the most profound impact on uh, yeah, temperature, wind, humidity. Had there the most is. impact. It was yeah. a wind that had the most impact on firefighting. So if you have a building that the fire can be blown through, well, a lot of uh, people who have written articles before talked about getting ahead of the fire, cutting it off. So, yeah, and as far as being an exposure, just because you're a little further down down the road, if it is a long building, if that front wall were to collapse and pull in, it could. It can still get you far from the actual address that's on fire. Oh, sure. And, uh, you know, it, as far as being an exposure to collapse, you can take the corner if you can. If not, two and a half times the height of the building. you got to be away from it. Yeah, you're right. And uh, yeah. that includes your, your water supply, you know, maybe the command post. I mean, you want to keep some of these things away from the building in case it falls down, right? So make sure we do the math on that. Um, yeah. What's, what's another common mistake we see here with master streams is roofing material sheds water, whether it's from a, an, a fire appliance or whether it's from a rain cloud, um, master streams hitting a, a roof structure that's still intact, not doing us any good. Right, right? It's burning underneath. Captain obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> Captain obvious, but how many times we sit there and watch that for a half hour and you just sure. keep hitting that? I don't know why. Doing nothing nothing to well, no changes to water, fire. It seems to be getting hell? better. You know, we had that fire in Addison, our last big fire, and I was trying to remember how many apartments we lost, but it was a five-story, you know, like Jeff said, one of those five-story apartment buildings, and it had the uh, tile roofs. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, but it broke through to the point, you know, I could see it. I was driving in um, when a... I was driving in for it and uh, I could see it from, you know, 25 miles away as I got on one of our overpasses and I'm like, Oh, this isn't going to be good. And they were sweating pipe in the attic and it ran the whole attic, but master streams wouldn't get to it because it hadn't broken through the roof yet. Right. And, you know, they tried to do it, you know, at the time we had, they, they took two and a half to the top but it just wasn't enough water. You know, I always wondered, well, what it would wonder what would happen if we'd gotten rams in there in that attic and shot them up into the attic to put a knock on it, but you couldn't get to it from a master stream. You had to get it from underneath until that terracotta yeah. broke off and fell. And then you could get to it. And we left the master streams there for two days, Jeff. <laughs> so did you guys have any gables in that roof? Uh, I'm trying to think of a, uh, you know a gable like that yeah no it was more of a they're all hips yeah, it almost would look like a mansard but it wasn't a very lot okay lot. see yeah. now that, that's something about positioning of apparatus and depending on you know access to the roof with your platforms and you know what that was a tactic that was taught years ago and that was get the bucket up there with a couple of guys in it if they can take out the gables Mm -hmm. where you get your master stream set right there. Start playing it in from there. If you have a mansard, well, once again, you need the tools that break through. If your mansard is made of tile or whatever, something like that, you need a sledgehammer to do that. But you break through those uh, tiles right. and then you have to break through the, uh, what are they using, OSB underneath that or something like that? I don't OSB. know. OSB. This one's weird. It has tile on top and on the side, and then it has the rubber, neo the rubber lining. They've stopped putting roof material you know they just put a rubber skin right. over the top of the roof yeah membrane protection yeah and it just yeah. all it does is gunk up your saws but uh <laughs> um you know this was a it was a and to make matters worse there's trees all around the building to where you couldn't even get the aerials you know you had to go up over trees before you could get it and then by the time they did get up there i think the heat was so much that you know how much water were we actually getting in there well, so that goes right back to the sides of the stream and its penetrating force, mm -hmm. its reach. Yeah, exactly. So uh, with that, come again, I keep hitting planning you know, and, and being prepared and practicing. But when you're dealing with master streams, you're, you're into something that's beyond your bread and butter. So make sure that you're calling enough 
help to get there with you. Your, your standard first or second alarm probably is not going to be enough. Uh, you need to make sure that you've got not only units and people to help fight fire, but then reserve units to, to help do relief, uh, extensive overhaul, maybe, you know, checking downwind if it's a windy day for where the brands are going. I mean, it, it takes a lot more to get your head wrapped around a big fire because it's a big fire. It's multiple line fire and those suck because there's multiple lines. You need to have a accountability for all of it. Um, not just right, right now, but an hour from now and then two days from now, that fire needs to be thought about. Um, what, where else can we, we go with the discussion as far as you know, the streams and the placement and the application? Uh, we talked about how, how the apparatus has evolved and the different types of nozzle selections. Here's, here's, the, here's the interesting thing. Uh, about water supply at a major fire. So we go out and we hook a, a, a five inch, let's just say a five inch line from the hydrant to the engine. And we can flow upwards of 1500 gallons a minute, you know, through different appliances and hand lines, different sizes and things like that. And again, in Chad's case, he's got these five story apartment buildings. They're wood frame. Here's one. And this thing is roaring to beat hell. Let's just give it three floors. Let's not even say the building's completely evolved, but three floors. That's going to tax your personnel to the limit right there. Because you cannot just say, we're going to put a line on the third floor, the fourth floor, the fifth floor. This is how we're going to do it. Yeah, it sounds good when we're talking like this or when you're in a classroom and you're talking about academics. In the real world, when you got smoke banking down to the second floor or filling the street with smoke because weather conditions, atmospheric conditions, and things like that, it changes that you know pristine environment you know that we talk about in the classroom or the or the uh, parking lot into like how in the heck are we going to get guys in there? And we can't put guys in there like that and commit people above, you know, if the situation won't allow us. So now here we have this building that's rapidly deteriorating and you've got other buildings built the same way on either side, exposure zoo, what do we call them? Two and four or B and D. And maybe you got something on the seaside, even though you might not be by the ocean. We got to throw that joke out there. But anyways, you know, you've got to uh, think about the water that's necessary for those buildings too. So you got, you have to attack the fire. And Jeff, you brought it up about how long do we run a master stream, I think you said, you know, from yeah. one location. This is that whole thing about when we run out of stuff to burn here, then we might have to reposition that master stream to get a better angle of attack. If the fire gets into that exposure over on this side, you're going to have to put multiple hand lines in there quickly if you can, you know, start pulling the plaster or the, or the ceilings or whatever to try to get to the fire there. Otherwise that building is going to become a casualty also. And this is the whole thing about everybody being on the same page, everybody working under one command. None of this stuff where you run freelance into a building when you get there, because you're all excited, your pants are wet and you haven't even gotten there in the fire yet. Right. You know what I'm talking about? This is where company concept comes in also. And that's accountability. So we have, let's just say the fire building, your five-story building, and we got fire in those three floors and we're resorting to a master stream operation. We got two master streams, one at each corner going in. And now we have this building where the fire is getting into. And it's another wood frame building too. I, if I remember when you showed me around down there, that's what it looked like. They're all built together, but separate, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. See, where, where do those people come from? You know? And that's why, again, you got to go and get an order where you're going to position yourself and become part of the, overall plan lines in this floor this floor this floor you have to have you can't send a line by itself you have to send firefighters with tools one of the things i remember when i was taking all my my tech courses and so forth they were talking about administering to the fire ground you know you just can you know it doesn't look good when you're out in the third floor hey we need a hook up here it should have been up there and that's where engines do engine work and trucks do truck work. So I could probably go on and on with this, but we'll, we'll, we'll just leave all this food for thought out there. So Jerry, you, if I can get back to you, you're talking about that 
that specific target hazard where you know that the water supply is only going to be able to fight a fire to a certain size fire. And mm -hmm. that's what you're left with. So um, I'm sure all of us have been on fires that were losing battles um, where you knew you were going to have to be there for days. Eventually the incident commander turned those, uh, turned it from some type of offensive use to let's just protect exposures and settle in. We're going to be here for multiple days. Um, at what, like, at what point of your plan do you have as an incident commander where you're thinking, when is enough is enough? Like in your, that target hazard, what is the thing that's going to trigger the departments around you to say, okay, this is a loser. This was, it's a loser plan. This is where we're going to go. And we're going to try and make the stop here rather than trying to stop it in the building. Is that even, is that too far into the weeds for pre-planning or is that like a, a judgment call situational type thing? I think your, your point is really good, Jeff. I don't know what the answer is in my neck of the woods. It's, it's probably going to be when we're overwhelmed and we're at the holy shit point is when we start backing up thinking defensive or when we lose a fireman or something like that. I, I think the key here is that we know we have a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of fire potential and we have a limited water potential. So the, I think our plan, I frankly have been able to convince our leaders to develop a plan to use water from outside that fire, outside that water district. So um, the tank that supplies the area around this particular hazard, it's a he old heavy timber mill. Um, the next municipal water available to us is a half a mile away. So a little, you know, pre-planning, a little fire prevention here. If we developed a plan to get that water a half a mile away into this fire, uh, I think we'd be a whole lot better off. And it's great, like Jeff said, that, you know, we're all experts around the conference table, but if we pull an inch from here, an engine from there, do they have four inch, do they have five inch, do they have the fittings? It's the devils right. in the details, like, like Shoup was saying before that, that, so to answer your question, I think, I don't know that the, the question is, when do we go defensive? I think the question is, how do we go defensive? And you better have that plan in place and you better have it tested. Because in this case, there's um, there's mom and pop stores across the street. There's high density housing, three-story wood frames on the other side. So wow. Jeff, like you said, the building collapses, you get a huge influx of uh, fire brands and serious size fire brands dropping down on this housing area. You got high exposure or high radiant heat lighten up the other side of the street and guess what we don't have enough water for the fire now we don't have enough water for three fires so the plan better be you better have a plan on how to and you better have exercised that plan to get that big water in quickly because you're losing not only the fire building but you're losing two exposures at least yeah that, the conflagration whether it's in a commercial complex or residential i mean it's i think it most firemen go to one of those, at least one of those in their career. And it's, mm -hmm. it puts it into you like, wow. I mean, you think going to your house fires or your little apartment fires that, you know, you got this job figured out. Then you go to one of those big ones and you're like, man, I spent, I've been here for a couple of days now. This is not getting better. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's it, right. We, you know, we've lost the fire we, building. We, we lost the town. Listen. We lost the residences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, Just try to keep it in the same zip code. Uh, yeah. Right. There you go. Yeah. Hey, something uh, else somebody mentioned just real quick was uh, wind and, and Shoup was talking about straight stream versus, you know, or combination nozzles versus solid board. We talk about master streams. The wind plays hell with these. I, I know everybody knows that, but it just, again, something else to think about. You're, you're shooting that master stream up into the wind and wind's just going, you know, and your master stream isn't even getting water on a fire anymore. So at that point, like, you got to be able to look at that, admit that it's not working, and then try to reposition. Mm -hmm. Don't. I mean, those outriggers move both in and out, right? Yeah. <laughs> move know, it, theoretically. Yeah, yeah, again, you know, we, we saw changes in the American Fire Service starting in the 70s, and I, I can recall anyhow. I mean, there's always been changes in this, in this firefighting profession. But when I, when I came in and I was wondering, why are we doing this? Why are we getting rid of that? So forth. For example, you know, we used to have our own fuel truck. 
you know, major fires. That fuel truck would go out and, you know, fill up everybody's fuel tank uh, because you're pumping a long time. As you say, you're, this is going to be a fire that we're going to be at for a long time. So that was the reason for having one of those. But fire departments, and Chicago still got them. And I know New York has, uh, uh, what was the old Maxi Water system, Jerry? You know, they still got that? Maxi Water? Uh, rapid Water? Not Rapid Water. The Maxi Oh, the, water. like the super pumpers and that kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah. Right, right. They got something where they designed all these special pumpers and so mm -hmm. forth and hose wagons yep. we got rid of the hose wagons and many departments did because someone was going around saying oh well, you know you got to be progressive you got to be you know getting away from that old traditional stuff no no that stuff is still necessary today because it's i forget who said it it was the built environment that we've created that these fires look at Ch chad chad's prime example you know of you're building four and five story uh, residential structures out of wood frame. And we're seeing it everywhere, even, even uh, the older cities. You got the concrete platform and then you got the wood framing on those several stories above it. You're not gonna handle those with a hand line. So you need to have those deck, I'm sorry, not deck guns, but those uh, deluge trucks, I call them, with the large diameter hose. You know, if you got a water, uh, a river, major lake or a big lake or something like that, where you can have a fire boat or something hook in and you have these trucks with all that hose, San Francisco has got them. They got them for earthquake potential too. And they got cisterns in the streets and so forth. And you lay out and you tap off your engines or you get that big gun going, you know? And it's not a regular two, uh, uh, thousand gallon minute master stream. We're talking like we were talking before the start of the show here about two and a quarter, two and a half inch tips. You're throwing 2,500 gallons a minute because you need to in those fire situations. But we, we, we listen to people who says, oh, I'll get rid of that. We don't need that anymore and things like that. It's like, no, we hurt ourselves <laughs> after these fires, you know, and overpower them. So the initials, I've come up with initials for that progressive movement. It's called DOA, Destroyers of America. And it's like destroyers <laughs> of the fire service. You know, it, that when you say progressive, it's, I'm not sure it's yeah, really, yeah, I don't know. more regressive, isn't it? And soup, I guess we're, we're shit out of luck on the rivers. Uh, okay. <laughs> We're not going to have a fire boat. We might be able to get a fire sea dew. Well, those of us that fire do have to have that river or that lake or whatever. Or both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. I, I think this is a pretty good. Uh, we're at just about an hour. Uh, covered quite a bit here on the, on the master streams. Um, you guys want to go around real quick? Any other either uh, experience-based observations or, or something you want to add here before we uh, kind of sum it up. John, you got anything? No, I'd just say uh, to the officers out there and the firemen, you know, pay attention to your district, train on it, be prepared for that fire. Don't know when or if it's ever going to come, but be ready for it either way. Yeah, yeah I'll kind of sure. echo John. You know, when I started using that RAM, the guys had never done it. So we went out and we practiced on it. For a couple of weeks and I made sure everybody knew how to do it and could do it by themselves. You know, like you said, train on the, when you see the fire is not the first time to try it. For sure. Yeah. Big problems with that. Uh, Jerry or Jeff. Yeah. I just got one thing quick. Uh, we've, we, we all kind of think of master streams going this direction. I've seen them used very successfully in this direction. You know, the, the, uh, the tip out of a tower ladder bucket or even an aerial that's low and into the strip mall or that kind of thing. And, and it's kind of flexible. So you get some movement with it. Um, the, the, the water it's coming down this way and you all talked about it. It doesn't really necessarily get to a lot of what's burning. So when we see that aerial ladder up here, what, what happens? It operates for a couple hours until what? Until the roof completely burns off because that water is not getting onto the underside of surface. So um, we think about master streams using it that way isn't a bad idea either there you go hey jeff okay getting apparatus especially your engines in position your first your first arriving engines i won't say the first do but i'll say the first arriving engines when you're arriving and you've got that big ball of fire and you know you're going to have engines requiring a lot of water coming in 
subsequent arriving engines and the old guys used to be so good with this you know here you gotta you know again young kids you know are ready to pull a line they want to go inside we're going to take a line in here you got five stories of fire and it's like are we out of our minds no 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 bosses keep your young people under control make them learn as you guys were saying but to see subsequent arriving engines coming in and instead of driving in nose into the fire the old guys would stop and back that engine in and the intent was those engines already on the scene are going to need to augment their water supply so you could drop a supply line into their intake send that engine out to another hydrant on another main or something like that so they could guarantee that heavy volume of water uh, for that situation so yeah planning for that water supply need is huge on big fires it's it's a uh, definitely the deal breaker okay gotta get the water in all right well uh thanks for tuning in everybody uh try to catch us at the strategic strategic fire you can get us on the gmail and on the facebook i want to thank everybody for hosting us uh coming out and doing some hands-on training with you and also uh, stopping in virtually like this uh, it's uh, good to share what we have with others and uh, keep the tradition alive so uh, uh, thank you to Washington and look forward to seeing Waco next week. Yeah. Waco, Texas. Here we come. Looking forward to it. All right, guys. Yeah, if that's anybody it for has now. any interest in doing any training with us, by all means, get a, get a hold of us. You know, we're all available. Surprisingly affordable. <laughs> okay. Take care. All right. That's it. Have a good night. <laughs>